Joining me today is Monica Cox, and she is, let me read this off for you. She is a professor, a CEO, and an author. We'll hear more about that when we get into the convo. The convo today, we'll be talking about healing from a toxic work environment. So it's going to be a good, a good topic. But before we get into it, I must give Monica a moment to shine. Tell us more about yourself, anything you'd like us to know. And thank you so much for being here with me today. Take it away. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, CJ. So um, I am happy to be here because, um, you know, it, you do give us an opportunity to shine, first of all. And I am a presidential awardee, um, a professor. And I think most recently, now that I've lost my parents, I do talk about being a daughter. I talk about some of the personal things. I am um, a mom, a good mom a good wife, a good supporter, a good caregiver. And um, I'm a disruptor, mm. an entrepreneur, a podcast host, um, an author, an innovator. Um, I am a lot of things because mm. I have a lot of gifts in me. And I'm really realizing that my gifts cannot be contained by traditional systems. And I embrace all of that. So I'm that person. Yeah. And you know what? Just reading up on you, I, I, I saw that. And I'm like, wow, she is really doing all the things. And I love that. I love that when I can just see a woman shining and, you know, unapologetically taking up space. Right. So mm -hmm. kudos to you for, for doing that. And thank you again for being here with me today. Now, I typically ask the... Um, the, the employee to entrepreneur story, but I know for you, things are a little bit different. It's almost like you're on that bridge. You're, you're still, you're doing the professor thing. You're doing the entrepreneurial thing. What has, what I can ask you is what has your biggest lesson been so far in your journey thus far in your experiences and being able to wear all the hats and be a disruptor and an innovator? Um, I think it's the fact that I don't have to have just one story. Mm. And so often I think many of us see a career and we say, well, I have to be this, this person. I have to be this professor. And this is the trajectory after five years, 10 years, 15 years. And although there are many people who see that and follow that path, I am a disruptor because I realize that I can redefine myself and still be worthy without mm -hmm. the titles and without the accolades that I thought I needed when I was younger. Um, so for example, I'll say when I was 19, I wanted to be a university president. And over time, I'm realizing the influence of that position is not as big as what I am right now. And that may sound really weird because it's like there are certain um, goals and ways that we are taught to operate in patriarchal systems or um, or systems that embrace white supremacy. But I've had to shift, shift my thinking all the time to say, this is what aligns with my values. This is my core. This is what I want my legacy to be. And it's following that, that resonates with me more so than some um, some image that has been defined or has been told to me um, about yeah. who I should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when we when I think about what we're talking about today and knowing just from like your resume that you do have a lot of experience. Yeah. So the toxic work environment, as before we started recording, I did say, uh, mention to you that I recently had a, a conversation with a black woman actually is going through this, this experience right now of she's being discriminated against at the workplace. And she's of, of course having a really super hard time with the entire thing. Right. So toxic work environments, there, there are levels to it, of course. Yeah. Um, are you coming from a place of experience when you talk about this or just from supporting others through surviving and healing from and walking away from toxic work environments? Oh, gosh. Yes. Um, I've experienced this. And, and I have experienced it as a leader, particularly in my current organization. Um, it was something I did not expect to enter. Like, I really thought that um, when I came 
to be a first or an only, that the support was there, the infrastructure was there for me because people profess diversity, they professed inclusion, but I soon learned that just because people were saying it didn't mean that it was real. And when I pushed against that system, I realized how much that system wanted to remain as it was. So for me, there were a lot of a lot of lies. There was a lot of manipulation. There was a lot of fear. There was a lot of opposition to my leadership, a lot of stress. And it was deliberately hateful, deliberately mean. Um, and as some people have told me, it's like you would read this type of stuff, but it was uh, it was real. Like people really did not want to shift and did not want me to lead them in this space. And the protection that people feel that they um, have for that is, is I, I use the word professional lynching. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that happens in those environments. And I do want to talk a little bit about that term because um, I was reading a book by Keisha Blaine about Fannie Lou Hamer and it clicked for me very um, succinctly about why professional lynching or or my use of the term is appropriate. Because if you think about lynchings historically, um, for those of us who didn't live back in those times where it was just, you know, as more commonplace, um, you're, you're wondering, how did this happen? How could this mob pull somebody from their home, lynch them? A lot of people could come around and there was no accountability. And it comes from the place of not just the vigilantes wanting to lynch someone, but it's the system that allows Mm -hmm. those people to do it. It's the system that does not hold people accountable for lynching and slaughtering people who have been abused in the very system that it it professes is equitable. So um, this was a long way to say Mm -hmm. something Mm -hmm. like, I've had a lot of of time to think and to experience it on this level and see why people were silent. Why was there so much fear? And many times, like I saw firsthand how people did not want to be treated like me. And they knew that a system would not be, people in that system would not be held accountable for treating me Mm. as treated to. A lot to unpack there, but yes, I have experienced it. That was the short (laughs) answer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And in experiencing it, enduring it, Mm -hmm. and knowing just uh, the people I work with, the clients I work with, and most of them are very unhappy at their jobs. Not necessarily a toxic work environment, all of them, uh, but knowing that you're enduring this this experience, when when is it time? Like, how do you know when it's time to just walk away, to choose yourself and walk away? And what's the process to get there and to do it? Yeah. You know what? So there's like the physical, literal walking away. And then there's like a, sometimes like a mental walking away. And I am physically still in the organization where I, where all this stuff happened. I'm in a different position. And the thing that I have to mention to your listeners is that in higher education, you know, there's tenure, of course, it's a, it's a, it's a different structure sometimes when it's like um, going through the ranks and, like meaning that I do have a job, like I don't have to get an, you know, a annual something to determine if I retain my job, but um, I'm a distinguished professor in the organization because I've, I've done the work to be there. And there are so few of, of um, so few black women in that position. So in the rooms where we're talking about promotion, tenure, faculty governance, I'm often the only person in there who can speak to a lot of the the um, the uh, marginalized aspects. It hasn't been time for me to physically walk away, but it's about the mindset. Right. And although I'm there, I acknowledge a few things. Um, I think acknowledging, I agno- I've acknowledged the gaslighting. So I know that what happened was real. And I also use this term about being transactional. And to me, it means that I know how to see things for what they are. I know when to shut off and to say, that's not healthy for me. So I've created a lot of boundaries. And so I'm telling the story to say, even though I'm still in the place where I am, 
I'm able to see the system for what it is and to know what I bring to the system. I know how to show up and I know how to withdraw. I know like a lot of parameters that help me to physically stay there, but I've, dare I say, I've walked away in many ways when it's it's mental. But coming back to your question, I promise I'm going to answer this. I think it's time to walk away when you cannot, this is extreme, but when you can't, when you realize that it's fine, that it's hard for you to recover from that space. Um, Sometimes I think about like rubber bands and, you know, sometimes there's that elasticity, but when you see that you're just stretched so much and you're just not even elastic anymore, you're not yourself, you can't get that shape back, you can't do whatever, like that's telling you that that's a sign you're wearing away. And I think weathering is another aspect when there's brokenness and you cannot recover from that. When you're weeping, when you're sad, when you are not yourself, when you have to move out of your core, when you cannot be who you want to be in that space, those are signs as well. And I think the final thing I'll say about it is that it doesn't just happen. How do I say it's not just something like a light switch. It's not on and off. It's gradual. And you don't realize that that one thing is tearing away at your spirit or you are omitted from something and that wore away at you. Like it's it's a daily um, weathering, a daily tearing that happens. And I think you have to decide on that process when too much is too much. And I hope that many people will say it before they're broken. But then I'm also a fighter. And that's why I have not walked away because I feel like it's my calling to be in this space and okay. to call out certain elements of the system too. That was too long. <laughs> no, I think people are uh, people are tuned in and it's it's especially if the story, the experience, they resonate with it. They're in a toxic work environment right now. I think they're listening and, and they really want to be able to take something away from it or just feel a little bit more seen where in, they're, they're most likely in a situation where they feel very, very isolated. If yes. you don't have someone, you don't have the support or no one else is seeing what you're seeing or experiencing what you're experiencing. So hearing mm-hmm. you say this right now is the validation that they needed. Right. So yes. it's and, it, you know, it's it, you say that it gets to a point where, or you hope people get before they get to the point of being broken, that they know yeah. to walk away. But mm-hmm. some are still afraid to walk away. So yeah. it's almost like. A question. Another question. I on the other side is, what do they do to be able to survive or endure until they are they are at the point where I can I need to I need to do this for myself. But until I get there, because mm-hmm. there'll, there'll be different reasons. Maybe they can't find another role, or maybe they've just been in this role for too long, or you know they feel they feel like this is their only option. It's it's mm-hmm. never is, but you know how do people survive until they're ready to walk away? Yeah. Um, you know, I am a very strategic person. So so I really rely on being strategic and like I said, being transactional. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like um having a plan. You know, like if you have to stay there, but you know that your day to exit is coming, what are the lessons learned? What are the processes? What are the ways that you can um take information from that space and somehow apply it to your next? And I'll give you a prime example of how I was able to do that. So I was a department chair. I worked with a phenomenal assistant um, who was an attorney, very organized. Like we really balanced each other. And when I was no longer in this position, I knew that I still had the gifts and talents. And um, I called her up and I said, you know, what we had was magic. And I think that we can start a business. I think we can offer some services to people based on the roles that we had in this organization. Are you willing to do this? And um, we took a leap of faith and we're still growing that that business in that place. But like just last week, we traveled to Wisconsin to do a culture audit with um, with some clients. And it was it was amazing. And so there was a plan. You know, it was it was never my, one of my phrases that I often use is never defeated. I'm never defeated. And I think what you have to do is realize that 
you may be in a valley right now, but you don't have to stay in the valley. And while you're there, try to identify those things that will pull you up. Oh, there's a ladder. There's something I can hold on to today. And yeah, this is not my perfect day, but I know that this is something that's going to propel me to my next next level. Um, And I think you have to take, you have to surround yourself more than almost any other time that I've ever seen with people who just love on you. Mm. It is that moment where your circle may become smaller because you need something more in that space. As all that negativity is happening, allow people to sow into you. Um, Allow people to, like I said, pour into you. It's that moment because that's what you need as you build yourself up. You need people to hold your arms when they're tired. Um, You need to have fun. You need to just really do the opposite of what you're seeing in that space because you are valuable. Affirmations, whatever. You are enough. You are a champion. Whatever you have to do, like that's what you're doing behind the scenes all the time. Pouring, pouring, pouring. And it's lifting you up. It's holding you up. So. Yeah. Yeah. And you you need a village. You definitely need your village. Um, So, okay. So let's say they have reached a point where they cannot take anymore. They choose themselves and yeah. they have decided to walk away from this very toxic environment experience. However we want to term it. Mm-hmm. Are there, and it's, now they have to begin to heal before they really go on to the next step in their journey. There has to be a lot of healing that happens yes. there. And that's what today's topic is about. So are there strategies? And you said you're a strategic person. So are there strategies now to healing from walking away from um, a toxic environment? I think so. Okay. And you know what? It is pain. I hate to say it's painful. I want to say that you could just walk out the door and be like, I'm happy. But that is not how it works. And mm-hmm. I often use the idea of grief so that yes. people can kind of understand yeah. how this healing is going to happen. Yeah. Um, I told you before we started that I've lost both my parents. And mm-hmm. I'm an only child. And so the grief that I felt at the loss of my parents, um, it was hard. But I often tell people the grief that I felt for work is harder. Mm. And some, some people, it's like, what does that even mean? That just sounds really odd. And I say, I tell people, I know my parents loved me. I know they sewed into me. I know they wanted the best for me. So the grief was the physical separation for me. I miss them physically, but the warmth is there. The love is there. So when it's hard, I remember good things. When it came to work, it was just pain upon pain upon pain. Mm. And I expected so much. There was no reconciliation. There was no restoration from them. And the grief that I experienced was just there. It it laid on me like a rock. I'll say that. So the healing that I had to do was much deeper. It was much more intense for me because I now realize it was abuse. When someone, when you open yourself up to an environment and you expect policies and ways to be real, it's like, Anything can come and attack you. Anything can tear you down. And I realized it's like I opened myself up to be violated, to be exploited, abuse, ultimate abuse, things that I I protected myself from the world because I expected it. But the openness that I had hit me to my core. And so I feel like I need to explain that to your listeners first, just the depth Mm -hmm, of what I'm mm -hmm. saying. But to heal from that, You know, I said it, I've I've said it multiple times. You have to go back to your core. I had to go back to my worth and really, really, really remember my why. I had to remember my calling. I had to remember all the positive seeds that had been sown into me my entire life. My purpose, everything. And when I, and that meant separating myself from some of this environment, like taking that extra time to really go back and love me, love everything that I loved when I was a child, love the creativity, love the laughter, love the joy, the core. 
And once I did that, I would always find a way not to censor myself. I went to therapy too. So this is like a whole, there's some therapy tools here. Yeah, yeah. But when I wanted to put myself down, I caught myself. Where's that coming from? Why am I saying that? Is that real? Is that not real? That's not real. That's not true about you. That is not who you are. Do not go there. And it was constantly, no, no. That's abuse talking. That's workplace abuse talking. That's people putting you down talking. That is not who you are. So that took a long time. Um, It was also, man, you're pulling a lot out of me. It was also the fact that I made myself small Hmm. because I realized that my openness, my directness, my bluntness, everything that was me intimidated people. It made them angry. But it it was similar to what I just said in that I realized I needed to put myself out there because that's who I was created to be. Right. There were people who would say, Black women are not supposed to promote their gifts and their talents. Well, guess what I did? I promoted my gifts and talents. Amen. So everything that was the opposite, everything that the system told me I was not supposed to do, I rested it and I had to process why. Why do I feel that I can't be great? Why can't I tell people that I have the talent to write a novel, that I have a podcast? Why can't I talk about topics that nobody else wants to talk about? Because that has been given to me. And it's like, as I stepped out day by day by day, I got more confidence. And I said, you know what? I don't care what they say anymore. I don't care how they persecute me because I'm in my zone, I'm in my space and I'm Mm. walking in fullness. And the healing also came when I said, if there are people who can't go with me on this journey, they don't belong there. Mm. If there are positions I don't get and opportunities I don't get because it's too much, they shouldn't be in my life. It's a whole process, a whole process. Yeah. Yeah. And It comes back to not just rest, because, you know, I know there's a lot out there that talks about the power of rest, Mm -hmm. but it comes back to knowing that you are so valuable that if you never get another title, if you never supervise another person, if you never ascend to that thing that everybody else says is great, you're still great. You're still all that. That is a mindset where it's like, I don't need that. I don't need that permission to be great. I don't need that permission to lead. I don't need that permission to flow in the gifts that I'm supposed to flow in. And that is just, it's the healing. And before you know it, it's like, this is who I am, unapologetically open. I don't have to hide anything on social media. I don't care what you say. You don't like me. Guess what? It doesn't matter. It's a process. It's a journey. It's It's a journey. journey. Yeah, it absolutely is. And the journey begins by deciding to walk away, actually walking away, realizing you survived not just a toxic environment, you survived the walking away. And this is like the first day, sort of rest of your life. So you're reclaiming your Mm -hmm. life. And you know what's so funny? You got me Mm -hmm. thinking about something. You know what it is? That's why I can Mm -hmm. stay in this environment. People be like, how are you in this space? Right. (laughs) How are you in this space that's so crazy? Because baby, my mind and everything... Run me my check at the end of the month. Those are my reparations. Okay. As I do my other stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's almost like it's another level. And I and I was going to save this for the end, but I want to share this with your listeners too. Because okay. my revelation over the past couple of months, um, when you think about Audre Lorde talking about the master's um, house and the tools and how the master's tools will never destroy the master's house. I began to see that. And so often we try to get into systems to get recognition so that we can be recognized in the master's house. Mm. But we understand that you have your own land. You have your own house that you can build. You have everything in your power to set up a system and a way of operating that is very different from the master's house, then that empowers you. And my aha, and this is the first time I've said this on a podcast, on an interview. Ooh, so you're about okay. to this because it's a moment. You know what I realized? Because I am, a, I am a spiritual person. I'll be like, why am I still here? 
-hmm. because I feel, you know, it's like I'm called. I'm in this system. What is it? I know the system very well. What is going on? You know what the aha moment is? Lay it on me. Everybody can't get in the house. Everybody who is a disruptor can't stay in the house. But my role is to see people who are also in the house and hold my hand out and be like, hey, sis, let me tell you how to get free. Let me show you this land out here. I know you got to stay in the house for a minute, but I want to give you a vision. I want to show you. See that plot over there? That's yours. You take that and you can have that too. It's in you. When you're ready to walk out the door, that's it. But you know what? As long as I'm in this house, I'm going to shake it up. I'm going to learn the systems. I'm going to learn the processes. I'm going to get some of the resources. I'm going to do the stuff that's going to build up my house until it's time for me to go. And people often think that dismantling is like, oh, I have a match and I'm going to burn it down. Just burn it down. No, nah, boo. It's more strategic than that. It's about knowing in this season, in this position, in this place, what is it that I'm supposed to learn? What is it that I'm supposed to know? What is it that I'm supposed to borrow? What is it that I'm supposed to maybe tear down a little bit, knock a brick down? What is it that I'm supposed to do while I'm here? But the ultimate goal is my house. It's yeah. this building. It's this community. It's this place. It's knowing how I have to operate. And if I'm in this space, I'm going to learn it all. Yeah. Well, in the so system, work the system for your favor. Yeah. But it's an emotional thing, too. Do you? I mean, it's another level of being able to see it and to be like, oh, OK, I wasn't included in that. But I didn't need to be included in that. I, I still have that info. It's fine. I still know what's going on. It's OK. Mm -hmm. It is, a, you know, everything you're saying, it is very much a mindset thing. It's a, it's a process. It's a journey. It's an experience in and of itself. It's because once you can make that decision that I am in this situation and I know I deserve better, I see what you're doing. I see what you're, how you, you're trying to break me down. And also, but if you can decide to reclaim and take control Mm -hmm. of your emotions and how you react and respond, even that bothers them too, right? You, If they can't break you down, <laughs> right? Because you have made the decision while I'm here, I'm going to use it in my favor. I'm going to work the system in yeah. my favor, yes. right? And while you're in there, it's, it's all, it really is truly a mindset thing. And healing can be a yeah. lifelong journey and healing can be a beautiful, it's ugly in parts, Yes. Super messy in others, but yes. you continue to heal. You continue to continue through that journey. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Okay. 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 So mm. I have a, so as I want you, you know, in the beginning, I always give you a moment to shine. We talked about unapologetically highlighting your gifts, all that beautiful stuff. You mm. are a published author. You got a novel coming up. I like to ask the question, what do you have coming up? So tell us more about what you have coming up. Tell us more about this, this, uh, this new novel, if you'd like. Yes. So I have a novel. Um, it's under contract with Be Love um, Publications. And it is a love story. It is a love story about a Black woman engineer. Um, it is... Um, it's it's the story that I wish that I could have told for myself sometimes. Like okay. this was my pandemic project. So we were talking about healing. Another thing is that I learned a lot during the pandemic. And um, I was caregiving for my mom and I was working with a group of women. And we said that we wanted to create these characters and we decided to write books about them. And I looked at YouTube videos. I was never a creative writer. I'm an engineer, engineering educator, all this stuff. And I began to realize that there was just this therapeutic way that I could move characters so that they were empowered, that I could tell the story, parts of my story in a novel, but give it maybe a happy ending that I didn't always get. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope that it will be relatable to people, that they will see what it's like when you have a dream. Um, to to lead in an organization, but things just don't work out and you're not in control, but you have to pivot. And what does a pivot look like? 
How do you keep going? How do you form community? How do you, how are you strategic? Um, how do you rely on your family? How do you rely on your friends? Um, you know, that's what this is about. And I think so often we do need to see ourselves, even in fiction, because the weight of this world, the weight of the things that we go through is so much. So it's called Legacy Unleashed um, by me, Monica Cox, no pseudonym, and it will be released on Amazon. Um, and the, the dates will be a little bit different, but re it released October 21st. Um, after act October 21st, it will be... Um, it will be available. And I want to say like even a small thing, even as you talk about healing, mm -hmm. um, I told you like my father has passed, but my father's birthday is the day that I'm doing the release. And so instead of being sad, even in that form of grief, I'm doing something that replaces that. When I rebranded my business, I did it on the third anniversary of the passing of my father. So I try to also... Um, align the celebrations in my life with those things that could be very negative in yeah, my life. Yeah, yeah. Because I always want to to show there's a valley, but there's a mountain, and this is what life is. And I'm going to keep going because that's what my ancestors would have wanted me to do, and it's what I have to do to fulfill my purpose in this one life that I get, that I have as well. So I hope you you hear throughout this episode that is deeper than just a job. Like, even though I think we we're just going to talk about a job, like it's all woven for us as, as black women um, or women of color, you know, we have so many things that people don't know about the caregiving, the hurt, um, the personal responsibilities, but we keep going. And what does that look like? And how do we weave it all together so that we control the narrative? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so at the end of our lives, we know we focused on the right things, not just on the work, but on the big picture and on the yeah. legacy, Legacy Unleashed, obviously the name of the book, but something bigger than us. It's all about the bigger picture. That's it. Yes, it is. It is. Oh, and I know that we could. I could leave there and say that was your nugget, but I have to ask, <laughs> do you have a nugget to share with us today? to leave anybody healing in a toxic environment what do you have for us i do i do um you know this is from my heart because i remember the mornings when i could not sleep i remembered waking up and just wondering what is tomorrow going to look like for me am i going to be safe is today going to be a decent day and as someone who has gone through years of trauma and, and many of it was, it's just something I had to go through like legally, just things I could not just say I couldn't do. You, um, you just have to, you hold on and just know that things are going to get better. And I say this because I know so many people who have, um, and I didn't expect to go in this direction. I know people who have died by suicide. I know people who did not see the light. They did not think that they could make it. And um, I know the days can get dark. And sometimes you, you have to just take that break and do what needs to be done. But I promise Promise, 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 promise that a brighter day will come and everything will come together as it needs to for your life. It may not be in your timing, but every day that you stand up and say, I'm determined to stand. If that's all I do today, I just stood today, that's enough. But you made it one day and you're going to stay in the next day. And one day you may be able to jog and one day you may be able to run. But over time, it gets better. I feel like that's the thing about healing. It does. You will see the sun again. You will. If you hold on. 
Thank you very much for your transparency today. I, you know, I knew from the topic that it would be a very heartfelt conversation. And mm -hmm. I really appreciate you um, sharing with me and with the audience and being so very transparent, so very candid. I mm -hmm. celebrate you. I am rooting for you. I applaud you and everything you have accomplished so far. You have endured so far. You keep going, mm -hmm. like you said. And the, and I hope that sun continues to come up for, for you. Thank you so much, Monica, for being You're here welcome. with me today. Thank you. Thank you so much.